Good afternoon. I'm Diana, a member of the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The AZLA Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase knowledge, skills, and ability of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in watch and listen only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementino will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you're unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email being shown on the slide now. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. We'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona, such as today's webinar. Visit www.azla.org for additional information. The Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link of, in your webinar follow-up email. We want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series brought to you by the AZLA Professional Development Committee. Join us on June 13th for Summer is Upon Us, Extreme Heat Preparedness in Arizona. Heat is the leading cause of weather-related fatalities and injuries across the country, according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Arizona Department of Health Services reports the state is seeing longer periods of extreme heat, with summer 2023 being the hottest summer on record, resulting in over 4,000 heat-related heat -related emergency department visits. Heat-related illnesses ranging from heat exhaustion to heat stroke contributed to over 3,200 in the 10 year period before 2023. Effective heat preparedness and response will require cross jurisdiction collaboration, coordination, and communication. The webinar will provide an overview of statewide heat preparedness efforts for the 2024 heat season, as well as strategies for building heat resistance, resilience. Panelists will also share tools and strategies that can support library efforts in addressing community needs during extreme heat season. A link to register for this webinar will be, be, will be provided in your webinar follow-up link. I'd like to thank you all for attending today and please welcome Corey Sisko for her presentation, Connecting Through Collections, a Community-Centric Approach. All right, let me share my screen. Can everyone see that? Just want to make sure everyone. Oop. All right. So my name is Corey Cisco, and I'm really happy to be chatting with you all today about my presentation, Connecting Through Collections, a Community-Centric Approach. I'm a project coordinator at the ASU Library, but I'll go on into a little bit more about me in a few slides. But first, I want to talk about the overview. So the Future of Print Initiative is really what kicked off the Future Collection Program. So I'm going to be talking about that, and then I'm going to go into collection development and then the strategies that go into um, our outreach, and then we'll talk about the Future Collection process, some successes in the program, and some examples of future collections that we've done. And finally, we're going to go into social media. Just check in the chat here to make sure everyone can see. Awesome. Okay. Let me... Perfect. 
Okay. So my objectives here are learn about the future collection program at the ASU library and the role in collection development and community engagement, learn strategies for diversifying library collections through direct input from community members, gain insights into leveraging social media as a tool for collaborative opportunities in library programming and outreach initiatives. So I'm Corey Cisco. As, like I said, I'm the project coordinator for OpenStax at the ASU Library. Just to give you a little bit about my background, I have a BA in English with a minor in Creative Writing and Religious Studies. I have an MA in Interdisciplinary Studies, which was just a program that allowed me to have an emphasis on a few disciplines that I like, which is English and Gender Studies, a little bit of Media Studies mixed into there as well. Um, for my thesis that I ended up doing. And then I recently graduated with an MA in Library and Information Science. I'm also an avid reader. I'm particularly interested in women, LGBTQT+, um, and BIPOC authors. I really believe in the power of reading, which is why this position called to me about two years ago when I first started. I love reading narratives in particular that are outside of my own experiences, and I believe that it's important to do so in order to just learn and grow I want to be exposed to different kinds of things. Uh, I have quite a history at ASU, so the library was not my first job with Arizona State. I worked at the design school previously in student affairs, so I ran a team that oversaw advising, recruitment, project management, and event planning, so student-centered and faculty-centered, um, you know, initiatives and, you know, events and whatnot was really at the center of what I did and still do, and uh, I want to mention that I'm a small business owner only because I really believe in the power of community. I really believe that it is everything in terms of the work that we do at ASU, but then also in terms of being a small business connecting with everyone. And I do try and translate that into the work that I do every day too. And that brings me to the Future of Print initiative. So this was a three-year-long project that started in 2017. Um, this was a project that um, had principal team members that really kicked off a lot of exploring the impact of print in the digital age. So Lori McAllister was the principal investigator who is the former associate university librarian um, at Arizona State Library. And then Sherry Laster, who's my boss, um, she is the head of Open Collections Curation and Access. And they did a lot of this groundwork and ended up hiring a team when they received the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant. So this was an implementation grant that allowed them to explore a more data driven and community forward approach to developing inclusive collections. And this was in conjunction with the Hayden Library renovation that was supposed to happen in March 2020. And we all know what happened in March 2020. However, um, this project still I was able to do work in terms of figuring out how collections might best engage with diverse communities in which we live, which we study, and which we work. So when things opened up and started becoming a little bit more accessible in terms of the physical spaces, I joined the library and was able to pick up um, back from where that work where they ended. And now we have a fully um, you know, fledged out feature collection program that I'm excited to talk with you all about. And one thing I will mention is they're on the future print website that is on the ASU library page. You can actually read the original white paper that they wrote. That is really interesting. And I suggest reading if any of this calls to you. There is also an upcoming white paper that will talk about the conclusions and their findings from the grant. So I highly suggest um, reading it and I'll include the link later on in the presentation as well. This brings me to what is a feature collection? So this is the work that I do and um, I, I, I really love it. So I'm excited to talk to you all about it. And um, so essentially they're a product of collaborations between the library and then our communities. And we really wanna create meaningful learning and engagement opportunities using both print and digital resources. And what can be included in a feature collection? So um, mainly we include books, um, physical books, but also we include reproductions of journal articles or um, um, archival materials, we include DVDs, CDs, not so much anymore, but still, still have a place, and um, government publications we also can include as well. The other side to um, the future collection program is that we can also use 
library guides, which are our openly accessible platform that we utilize at the library. So there are a few examples of feature collections that um, are on that platform. And what include what are included in those are open access materials or licensed ebooks, content available through our ASU digital repositories, or other content that's openly available with with on the internet with the appropriate permissions, of course. And really what the purpose of these feature collections is, is we really want to creatively use our library spaces. And I'll go into a little bit more about what those locations look like um, within the, the Hayden Library specifically. But then also we want our AUC communities to engage with the resources that we provide. So that's something that is really at the forefront of the ethos of the feature collection program. And finally, an aspect to feature collections that I want to mention is we have assessment mechanisms. So really what that means is that we... Um, have I've been working specifically on building out reports that um, can give you meaningful you know, feedback in terms of circulation stats, your loan data, and hopefully that will also inform future collection development, which I can talk a little bit about too later on. So really this, uh, the future print kicked off feature collections and it's really about shifting the perspective on the notion of print is dead. We certainly don't believe that here. And um, it really is about creating dynamic collections that support the, a variety of learning and scholarly activities. So when we are approaching a feature collection, we always try and approach it with why are we doing this and what does it bring to the table in terms of the conversation and what we wanna to contribute to the library as a community space and trying to define a more local and curation print strategy that is meaning, meaningful and sustainable for the library. So in that white paper I mentioned that kicked off the future of print initiative, there were specific call outs for what kind of work that they wanted to do. And um, I outlined some goal highlights that we have or are currently working on um, in order to you know, really call back to what the original intent of this initiative was. And so I'll just list a few of them is co-creating collections with faculty based on their research. We wanna create collections based on student interest, develop exhibits and collections in alignment with events on campus, collaborate on curriculum specific collections. And a lot of that, a lot of those collections have been based in our classroom collection space, which I'll talk about. Develop first semester, first semester collections, a local author collection. We currently have the ASU authors feature collection that is um, available. However, um, outside of ASU, we should pursue something like that too, which um, is a plan. And uh, collect and analyze use data to inform collection development, which we have been doing, and then curating staff picks, which we recently did for National Library Week for our um, internal campaign. The community-centric collection development approach that we take is we want people to come into the library and see themselves in our collections. And we certainly aren't um, all the way there, but we're trying very hard to get there. And um, really how I approach this in terms of the feature collection program is really talking to students, faculty, and staff about their interests in a variety of ways. Um, talking about their interests academically, personally, and professionally, making sure that they the things that they need and want to see are available to them. And that means pinpointing gaps within our OpenStack collections and where we can make more pointed purchasing decisions. And that's really where the feature collection program comes in key. You know, we did a collaboration with um, Jessica Salo, who is an archivist for Black Collections within the Community Driven Archives Initiative. And we were able to work with her and her intern at the time to develop a collection called Black Voices, which was one of the first things that I talked about to Jessica when I started about two years ago. And it was a, an amazing collection, really, really diverse material and a, a, a big list. It was about 120 books that we were aiming to collect. And we only had about 60% of them, which is just not something that we were really happy about, but we saw it as an opportunity to pinpoint those gaps and fill um, the gap that we ended up, you know, kind of seeing through that project. And ultimately, me and Sherry Laster are working on a platform in order to analyze uh, diversity of our collections through a case study like this. So it's a work in progress, but we certainly are aiming and hoping to be able to create something that can help us in these instances. 
And then curating future collections that really represent the full diversity of the AC community and then our surrounding communities as well. And this means partnering with internal organizations that are doing this work. I really want to call out the Labriola National American Indian Data Center and the Community Driven Archives Initiative. They're doing amazing work internally and externally within our communities. And we really just hope to continue to be collaborators with them because they've been really successful. And um, we also want to make sure that we're going outside of the ASU library to expand beyond our own knowledge within the university. This brings me to outreach strategies. So um, this is all just in terms of my experience and what has been successful outside of it, um, you know, the ASU library and um, during my time here. And uh, event tabling is something that I've been able to do. I really need to call out uh, some collaborators like Christina Peck and the communications team at the ASU library who allow me to hop into a lot of the outreach work that they're doing. And they even allow me to give tailored prompts for students. Um, we do Forkham Fridays, which are just like student-based events. Um, and I'm able to you know, put out a prompt of what your favorite book is, and we can engage in discussion and gaze interest. And, you know, with those sorts of really simple prompts, I'm able to kind of see thematically where students are at. It's a lot of self-help and nonfiction, um, which has really informed a lot of the collections that we have done um, at the beginning of semesters and whatnot. And I can't say enough that organic relationship building is so important. I can't tell you how powerful the word of mouth is, especially when it comes to the feature collection program so far. I have a pretty wide network at um, ASU and within you know the outside community due to the you know the uh, small business that I have and that really comes in handy in terms of connecting with appropriate people or at least knowing where to go in terms of you know asking the right questions and whatnot and I gotta say I'm really um, lucky to have amazing colleagues within the ASU library that librarians and staff that have been here a long time and are so um, open with their you know networks and just information and I'm always willing to put me in contact with the right people and successful partnerships with student organizations, students talk, and a lot of the time I get reached out to by a student organization that heard about a collection that we did and they really wanted to be a part of it. And um, that is how our Heritage Month's um, future collections that we have done on our first floor have really blossomed um, because of that kind of connection that comes from students talking. And then also just knowing staff within departments. I can't tell you how um, it's come in handy in terms of knowing communications folks. And I'm like, hey, can you put this in your newsletter? This is relevant to your you know, population. So that's always been very helpful too. And then building your outreach list. So I really at the beginning of the summer before we enter into a new academic year, I uh, think holistically about it, what I want to do in the next academic year. Maybe not even specifically have like featured collection ideas in mind or themes, but thinking about wh what kind of collections we have, we don't have, um, what I would like to see. So building my outreach list out of what those thoughts are. And we are fortunate in the sense that we have Sun Devil Sync, um, which is a platform that outlines like all of the student organizations on campus. So I really use that list a lot too, and to go onto department web pages and whatnot and contact faculty. And um, I'm not above calling, cold calling or sending an email, <laughs> you know, I'm just introducing myself and kind of giving my pitch and um, sometimes successful, sometimes I'm not, but you know what, all that matters is that I'm trying I'm trying to get the word out there. And I do actually um, get quite a bit of responses back just because, you know, they, they want to be involved and it's, you know, a, a cool program. Um, I'm also not above showing up to board and department meetings if they're open to the public. So I certainly have done that as well. Um, just kind of talking about the things that we do. And sometimes I feel like people don't know how to approach the library, um, but putting kind of a face to the library and talking about the things that we do and wanting to collaborate and whatnot and wanting to, you know, have their voice be heard in our space is something that people are usually receptive to. And uh, the last thing that I'll mention is social media. Um, plenty of departments or people have seen me be goofy on the internet in terms of on the ASU library's uh, Instagram. So I've been reached out to because of that. We're like, we saw this really you did and we'd love to do a collection and we kind of want you to do something similar for us. And, um, you know, very flattered that that uh, my goofy role was what got them in, but certainly I'm open to it and always open to have a conversation or a meeting about, you know, what they're kind of thinking about. 
This brings me to the feature collection toolkit. First, I want to say that I need to give credit to Emily Patney, my predecessor, and then Sam Michal, who he um, is still within the ASU library, but is going on to do um, different kind of work, but really um, kept the program alive. And um, they developed this original uh, toolkit, and I just want to give credit to them for doing that. And um, as I've become more familiar with the program, of course, made a little bit of adjustments, but um, at the end of the day, this is a, a wonderful resource for our collaborators, um, both internally and externally. I like to start off by sending this to them to really figure out who the internal library departments are and stakeholders, how things kind of operate internally, and then what designing a feature collection looks like. Um, it, it's a short document, but it, it's pretty thorough in the sense that it answers a lot of general questions that people might have. I also hope it you know, because it outlines the entire process with options, it does spark some creativity um, and some ideas. And then once we kind of meet, we can talk about managing the expectations and kind of talking about timeline and whatnot. And it shows some previous examples too, which I've always found helpful in terms of idea generation. And that brings me into the process. So Ultimately, we need to figure out what our theme is, right? We need to figure out what our subject and the goals are for the collection. And um, if someone comes in with an idea, that's really great. If they don't, that's okay too. We can talk about, you know, different things. I always do share what is successful with feature collections and what has not been in terms of circulation stats. Um, so I try and do my homework before we go into a meeting like that. Um, but really pinpointing this at the beginning will help inform the collection title, the book list, and then the ultimate um, collection description that contextualizes it all together. And um, I think it's a really important first step in order to continue to do the work. Then this brings me to location. So as I mentioned, um, we are very lucky to have a lot of space to work with, especially at the Hayden Library um, on the Tempe campus. So there's quite a bit of um, places that we can place feature collections. However, um, they different places have certain benefits, right? So I try to kind of explain that context, but then also while we're trying to pinpoint our collection, I, I like to go on a tour with people if they're available and able to. And um, we walk through the library and we talk about exactly, you know, what location means what. So um, just to do a very high level overview. So we will start with the concourse lobby here. This is more staff curated collections that are currently available there. That's where our recent staff picks refresh is. So um, that is where the main information desk is, though. So there are some benefits to having that, or, you know, organic traffic. Um, so that is one option. The next option is our classroom collection. So this is a unique spot because there are university classrooms on the perimeter of this area, which means there's a lot of traffic that comes in and out of these um, rooms all day. And it's a very diverse kind of group of students because they're all different classes and majors and whatnot. And uh, yeah, they're just a lot of people walking through the space. If we don't have a faculty or curriculum based collection that's in the works, what I will do is I will actually take a look at the class schedule and try and align collections that are already you know, available and up and move them into these spaces so people can, you know, find them. And if it does spark their interest because of the class that they're, you know, taking, that's great news. And it allows us to kind of keep collections moving and whatnot and get different kind of exposure. Next, I will talk about our first floor mobile displays. So I've been mentioning the Heritage Month aligned collections, and this is where they typically begin on a mobile display with a specific design sign. And this example right here is the Indigenous Speculative Fiction collection we did with Labriola in November. Um, really great collection that is now up on the second floor next to their new um, space, which is really exciting. Next, I'll talk about the second floor North Lounge. So on the second floor, there's a bunch of study space and tables for students to sit. Then we also have our Sun Devil Reads collection, which is mirrors what uh, public libraries offer in the sense of popular fiction and nonfiction. So it's a browsable collection that's um, on the left hand side but we do have some perimeter shelving where I put a lot of the student-centered collections and there's also second floor central lounge that is right behind the Sun Devil Reads collection that is similar in terms of its scope. The third floor mobile displays are more 
place-based. So this creation station that I have here um, pictured here is actually was in collaboration with our makerspace. So they created a collection that um, have materials relevant to 3D printing, you know, all different sorts of maker, you know, ideas and um, really interesting books. The other two collections that we have on that um, floor are data science and open science. And that is where um, those departments are located too. Lastly, I'll talk about the fourth floor collections. So this is where our actual general collection or open stacks is located. So um, on the perimeter of the whole floor, though, we have shelving, which is a lot of shelving. And, you know, this is my main focus, um, you know, moving forward is um, filtering out these collections and refreshing these spaces and also utilizing um, some of the collections that we have on other floors and, you know, just kind of refreshing, but also adding some new collections, too. So a lot of space to work with on that floor as well. This brings me to exhibit design. So the exhibit design piece is really talking about how we want the overall look to be, you know, if we want sections dedicated to certain genres within the theme, or if we wanted to have a, a unique approach to how we're designing something or the collection sign, as you, I'll show some examples of that. And that brings me into like swag and print materials. So if we want a specific sticker, if we want an additional poster, working with our internal design team to make that happen will be key to this collaboration. And um, one example that I have is I partnered with Counseling Services um, on a collection and they provided some collateral that was relevant to the services they provided. So we certainly can do that as well. And um, I would argue that this is the most important part, the curated book list. So um, as that book list is being, or as we figure out our theme, the book list will then start being built. And I really like to give autonomy to the collaborators or my partners in terms of providing those um, you know, recommendations because I want them to be able to really flesh out their idea and you know ha have them have full autonomy in terms of what they want to be said through their collection. However, with that being said, I'm always available and open to help in that research process. Um, I am you know, a person that loves to read and I think I've, I've read a decent amount of books. So if I, um, if I am able to help, I certainly will. But really where I come in in terms of this process is once that list is complete, then I end up doing the research on what we own and what we don't. And then really coming up with a plan in order to working with our key stakeholders in this, which is the acquisitions and cataloging team. So I make sure that um, we're on timeline. I'm verifying that they are able to do or capacity wise what we're proposing. And then once I get the green light, I then submit the purchase orders through a form. They end up making the purchases through their, you know, vendors that they deem to be best for this collection. And then as those orders start arriving, they catalog them and then they make their way back to me. So that turnaround time is about four to six weeks, which is why it's essential to make sure that we have we manage expectations and our timeline is um, clear in terms of all um, people involved. Then we go to the collection description. So this really can be worked on throughout the whole time that we're working on this project. But um, really, it's one of the last things that we'll finalize before we put up the exhibit. And the collection description can range. Um, I'll share a link towards the end of the presentation where you can actually get a full list of our future collections and the collection descriptions. And it really, it's just an, an opportunity to contextualize what the collection's about, what kind of books are involved, and then making sure that we're giving credit to the people that really made this come to life. And then one of the final pieces is making sure that I invite the collaborators to come and join me when I put up the display in the future collection. Um, I really want them to have the creative direction to put it all together. I make sure it's in order, but uh, they definitely get to have fun and be creative in that sense. And uh, they can put it all together exactly how they envision it. And then the final, final piece is really the marketing component. So depending on what we've talked about in terms of social media, if they want it amplified and where they want it amplified, um, we can then record some content or take some photos. I typically always take some photos just to, you know, internally let people know where things are. But I also like to make sure that I can get uh, this collection into newsletters or, you know, wherever we need to in order to make sure that people know that it is it is done and it is up. The future collection program. So now I want to explore some successes and examples of our collaboration. So I'll just summarize what I've kind of said in terms of 
our successes with our collaboration and they'll go into specific examples. So internal collaborators, librarians, staff members, student workers, so grateful to everyone in um, my organization for being open and willing to help make the future collection flourish. Uh, collaborators external to the library as well, uh, department-wide, you know, student coalitions, student organizations, and faculty. Our future plans are really to focus and develop our community partnerships outside of ASU. And if we have some time I can talk about future plans for future collections in the fall semester and then really focusing on those collections for heritage months they're incredibly popular and I think you know that they are um, something that students like to see or people that enter into the building and then collections for events on campus we've had success with that too and I just want to call out the image that I included on this slide here this is one of my favorite collaborations that we did it was an organic partnership in the sense that they saw the heritage month displays and they say they wanted to do a ramadan one so this was in collaboration with the muslim student association and they had a full range to decorate how they wanted their display they used some of their student organizations organization funds to purchase some things to decorate and all in all just a lovely group of people and now it's a permanent collection in the student centered second floor area. The first example that I'll talk about is a recent one we did. It's called Eco-Feminist Expressions, Converging Nature, Gender, and the Art of Storytelling. So this was a unique project because it was inspired by a student-led project through our humanities labs that's based out of ASU. And the theme was gendering peace and security. So this was done with some students in one of our social sciences librarian, Mimo. And the original project was a book list that comprised of 10 books um, about the topic of ecofeminism with a corresponding website. So as the semester was coming to a close, Mimo reached out and was like, you know, hey, let's, they already kind of did some of this work. So let's make this into a future collection. And I um, certainly was on board. This is the ASU news article that came out of that project. And it just talks about how, you know, the humanities that project actually translated into a real world impact, which you can see the feature collection is featured behind us. And I think the real important piece to this is, you know, embedding a librarian in a kind of department collaborative thing that is the humanities lab. And, um, to back up a little bit, the humanities lab is essentially uh, different kind of majors coming together to working on like a real world problem and I'm um, having cross director at faculty also teach. So a new element in terms of a partnership with the ASU library is embedding librarians into these classrooms and really um, connecting them with resources to support research and information literacy. So this was a really awesome project that we did, and I was super happy to see that the student and Mimo were highlighted for this specific collection. And yeah, it was just overall a really great experience. So one of our other collections that we've done recently in March was the Women's Coalition Stories of Healing. So this image here you can see is me being goofy on campus and dragging the mobile display around and creating some content in terms of really trying to amplify this collection, but also the amazing work that the ASU Women's Coalition does. So this was for the Women's History Month block party celebration. So this block party was totally put on by the Women's Coalition, but we did a collection in partnership with them in order to, um, you know, sh share stories of healing, share um, a lot of really incredible and powerful stories um, from, you know, women that have put themselves out there um, through literature. And the Block Party specifically supported locally owned women run small businesses. Um, so that was really awesome that we were able to, you know, help support that work. Then the next piece to this was they also did a call out for nominations for badass women and we were able to support that through also some content as well and they had other related events going on all month so we were hopefully able to with a collaborative post on instagram uh you know amplify what's going on you know in their community to our audience on instagram and I want to give a special shout out to some librarians that helped me Allenston Sierra and Leela they were able to really um just advance the collection with their recommendations. And I love being able to bring students and that librarian perspective together in order to really fully round out a collection like that. 
Our next co collection that I want to mention is a recent one that is still up in the lobby for um, AAPI Heritage Month, which is the AAPI Food and Culture collection we have. So this was an ASU faculty and staff collaboration. So Orcon, who is an ASU library staff member in public services, was really awesome in helping me make this come to life. And then we also had some faculty members throughout various schools assist in providing some really important texts in order to really talk about culture in a, a you know a productive way and the reason why we went with a cookbook collection was I shared early on in our meetings that we have really high circulation statistics for like our general cookbook collection that we have. So after talking through some of it, we thought it would be a great opportunity to develop that a little bit and provide some very specific um, cookbooks that, you know, are in relation to these communities. It's a great collection. If you're on campus, you should check it out. This is one of the first heritage collections that I was actually able to do. So this was the Honoring Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Collection that we did in collaboration with El Concilio Coalition and Nancy Godoy and Jasmine Torres um, within the Community Driven Archives really kicked it off by providing us with some uh, original titles. And then in collaboration with the communications team, I was able to additionally crowdsource some titles from our library staff as well. So it was a total um, group effort. The unique part of this collection, though, was that we were working with Cultural Connections, which oversees the, co the student coalitions on campus, and they invited us to do a pop-up library. So I took my mobile display uh, next door and was able to sit there through the author event and be able to check out books at um, when, you know, the event was over. And it was an awesome way to kind of see what they're doing in their department, but also kind of continue to build those relationships with departments outside of our own. One of my favorites that we've done is disability and inclusion. So this this was an original accessibility services feature collection that just needed a refresh with some modern literature. So I got connected with librarians on campus, Karen Grondin, who I heard was working on a certificate um, adjacent to these topics, and then Matt Ogmorn, and they were able to help me, you know, really figure out what kind of books we needed to add to this collection. And then I ended up reaching out to the Access Coalition, who was fairly new on campus. Um, and it just so happened to align with one of their first Heritage Weeks that they were going to have at ASU. So we were able to create a whole social media campaign to talk about the things that they're going to be doing for that week. And then we were able to have it out in the lobby for their, you know, their month. You know, they had a week, but we put it out there for a month. And um. Because of that exposure there, we ended up getting connected to the Braille Devils at ASU, which is another student organization, and they provided some additional recommendations in terms of some gaps that we might have missed, and that was just a really amazing perspective to have, and I'm really thankful for their contribution. So this was a ultimately a really great success, and it's still upstairs on the second floor student-centered um, space. Uh, one of my final examples is we did two collections for the University Sustainability Practices Department. So the right hand side here is um, a screenshot of a reel that I did bringing the books actually into the Garden Commons on the Polytechnic campus. So we did have this collection out there because of the space that they have. Um, we were doing a sustainable gardening more you know, kind of content-based collection. And then Every Day is Earth Day is the other one that we did, which is based at Hayden, but it's kind of done a few tour stops. We had it at Noble for a little bit, had it at Poly for a little bit. So um, I like having some collections rotating from campus to campus, which is exciting. But ultimately, these collections were to highlight Earth Month, Earth Day, and then some sustainability classes and like gardening events that they were putting on. And we were able to do a collaborative post highlighting all the things Things that they were up to. This is actually the department that saw me being goofy on the internet and reached out and said, we want you to do a display, like put together a display with us. So that was really fun. And um, we were able to continue to re refresh these collections too, as you know, new books come out, but ultimately they crowdsource with their faculty, their graduate students and teaching assistants in order to really make these collections awesome. 
Black Speculative Fiction is another recent one that we did. So this is unique in the sense that there was an art exhibit, which is the left-hand side image um, called Griots and Galaxies Unveiling the Multiverse of Black Speculative Fiction. So the design communications team was partnering with Lauren Ruffin, who is an associate professor at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society with some joint appointments and other um, departments. And they wanted a feature collection within the actual exhibit. So we were able to focus on four primary uh, genres that really comprise Black speculative fiction. So that was fantasy, science fiction, horror, and then the alternate history. This was really to demonstrate how each works um, to really imagine a better future for Black people. A really awesome exhibit. It was inter had interactive elements and whatnot, and we were able to buy some really cool books for this collection that we didn't have before. This is the Exploring Censorship and Banned Books collection that we did. So I know banned books and censorship is a hot topic right now. Um, unfortunately, a lot of books are being challenged. So we saw it as an opportunity when the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies Department reached out to us to host an author event for their Humanities Week. So uh, the author event was for a book called Here Are Voices, A Powerful Retelling of the British Empire Through 20 True Stories. Awesome graphic novel if you haven't read it already but we hosted the event here in Hayden Library we had a button making station that was related to the ALA freedom to read campaign then we also had this lovely collection here that was a curated list from shippers faculty and staff which included banned books themselves but then also literature related to censorship and we created two social media posts around the topics of banned books and the event that was upcoming the last featured collection that I'll talk about are these wellness collections. So um, last August, I was wanting to do a collection to welcome the students back on campus. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to make sure that they know that wellness is important. So let's put, pull some books together um, as a temporary display. Well, this book, this collection actually circulated about 80% within the first two weeks of classes. So um, it was an indication to me that we needed a permanent collection in order to make sure that, you know, we're we're being more um, pointed in terms of what the students really want and need. So we ended up creating this mental wellness display. I was redesigning our lobby, lobby collections at that point. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity to, um, you know, bring this collection in. And I ended up reaching out to counseling services as a collaborator and they provided book recommendations as well as department collateral that I mentioned for the promotion of their services. This is also still a really popular collection. It's hard to keep these books on the shelves, which just tells me that we need to continue to add books that are being published and um, you know keep this collection going. My final piece here is social media. So I need to call out my partners in this, the communications team, more specifically the social media team that oversees the ASU library accounts. They're always so supportive of me, you know, wanting to post make some posts for the future collection program. And they're they're just champions of the program and they always are here to support. So I really appreciate them. Really what I want to say about this specifically is, uh, you know, collaborative posts with the community members and organizations you're working with, I think is incredibly important. Not only do you get to be exposed to their audience, but they get to be exposed to what we're doing. And the ASU library has a pretty robust following on uh, Instagram. I also will say that the ASU, social media, there's a little bit of restrictions in terms of what we can and can't do. So depending on where you work, you might have a little bit more flexibility in the audio that you can choose and whatnot. But um, we still have fun in terms of what we can do for social media posts. But what I will say, full transparency, is that mostly I interact with the Instagram platform. Um, I'm not as involved in, you know, Twitter or X, as they call it now, and I'm LinkedIn. So that content is not necessarily as much that I work with. So for recording content, I always align them with the feature collection, the affiliated event, uh, especially if something's timely and coming up, I try and get on that in terms of providing some content, try and jump on trends when appropriate. I also try and keep a pulse on what's happening on Book Talk, even though we don't have have a TikTok account, um, try and keep up with what's really popular. Um, you know, as we're making these purchase requests for future collections, a lot of them are more recent publications. So if it's a highly popular book, making sure we highlight that, that we have it. And yeah, just having a good time with it too. And uh, one thing that I will mention is 
We also do Heritage Month book recommendations. So if I have a Heritage Month feature collection, uh, we will make sure that you, we are making posts for it every Thursday. So that communication statement, their student workers does a really amazing job of once I share that book list with them, they'll make sure that students that maybe not are, are not are based on this campus or are online, they are able to see the kind of books that we include in these collections. So that's just kind of an other connection piece that we keep throughout. And then one thing that we recently have done um, specifically with the Stories of Healing collection and our staff picks was we share shared fully curated lists. So this really supports the ASU online community too, which is pretty robust and continues to grow. So, um, you know, trying to think of future plans to really integrate into that community as well as something that's a priority for me. And yeah, the final piece that I'll talk about is, you know, polling and questions on Instagram. Polls are easier because you can just click a button and people can interact in that way, but you have to be really pointed and specific on what kind of questions that you're seeking. But I think it's another opportunity to take advantage of if you do have, you know, a social media account that is able to do that. And I'll make my final pitch for uh, collaborators. I'm always looking to collaborate, trying to widen our network. So if you are interested in uh, doing a feature collection with me, please reach out to me. My email is right there. And I just want to call out a few links that I've included here as well. Future of Print is the initiative that I talked about right at the beginning. So if you want to read the white paper or the upcoming white paper, please go there and look at it. Then the OpenStax link here is information on more general collections. And then the OpenStax Hayden is where you can explore all of the feature collections by floor. And please follow us on Instagram. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corey. We do have some questions for you. Great. Um, just one of the questions was, book displays are such an awesome way to engage with the community. How can libraries further drive engagement around the book display outside of the library? She's thinking about folks who don't often come to study or use the library space. You know, I would probably call back to your newsletters and your social media. That's typically how we try and get people, you know, that aren't in our buildings all the time to know that it is available. If you do have a, a robust e resources, you know, department to creating a feature collection that's only ebooks. I know that's something that we've talked about a lot. So if you have a platform that you're able to kind of really curate a collection that is online, Line. Certainly, I think that's an option as well. Are there any collections on the horizon that you're looking forward to curating? Definitely. I actually wrote them down so I can remember them because <laughs> there's quite a few. You know, one that I'm really looking forward to that is an external partner is we're going to work with Cardboard House Press. Um, that is a local press here in Arizona to um, have their full catalog here with us, which is really exciting. We only have a handful of them at this point, but hopefully we're able to get all of them. We actually want it to be at the West Valley campus and on Hayden too for um, the Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. So I've been working with a faculty member on campus that's doing a lot of programming around, um, you know, actually book binding and making books too, but then also working with the editorial director to make sure that we are able to purchase through their actual press as well because we want to make sure that they're um, you know fully getting those funds but then making sure that we create a really awesome display to mm -hmm. really get the ethos of what they're trying to do too. Fine. Can you speak to some of the challenges that you face either in when beginning the program or in your day-to-day -day working on the collections? Yes. Um, I think sometimes the initial reach out is, you know, something to overcome in terms of really trying to connect with people and have them hear what we're all about, right? Um, I also will say, even though I love students dearly, sometimes it's hard to, uh, you know, get them um, to respond to emails. Emails, like silly little things like that are challenges just to keep on timeline, but that's where I think me attending their board meetings and stuff too is really helpful because I can just do a little check in and, you know, ask if they need any help or support, um, you know, and the other some other challenges are really just internal, you know, sometimes right now we're 
at the end of fiscal close. So we actually can't make any purchases because the people that do the important things like close out our books are busy, right? So uh, making sure that I'm planning and according to their timelines and making sure that I'm really aware of mm -hmm. what their capacity is, is really important. So, and I'm sure that exists in all different kinds of organizations. So just really making sure what, um, you, you kind of know what's going on internally as well when you're collaborating with other staff. There's one that says ASU is huge. Yeah. How do you feel about the scale and making impacts in such a giant place? It's a really good question. Um, so I've been, I got all my degrees from ASU too. So I've been with ASU since 2011. So as a student and now as a full-blown staff, um, I have a lot of feelings about the, the size of ASU, but what I will say is that a real, a positive is that there, if you want to learn something, you can learn something at ASU, right? There is something for everyone. In terms of what, you know, the impact, I, if we can only impact a handful of people, I still think that's an impact. So I try not to think about the scale of ASU in terms of like a challenge or maybe a negative. Um, I think that seeing the excitement that I see working with students and faculty on putting a book collection together is just as about as much, you know, <laughs> fulfillment as I need. And then really seeing those circulation stats come back on our future collections, there is an impact. And, you know, I, I just think that existing at ASU, you know, as an organization, especially within the library too, sometimes it's hard to translate what we are here for in terms of like the large scale of it all, but the people who get it, get it. And um, we will continue to do our outreach and we'll continue to try and connect with everyone to make sure, just to make sure that they know that we're here for them. And that's what I really try to do with the future collection program is I want to hear you. I want to do something that you want to do. And I want to make sure that you're heard and we can, you know, bring your vision to life is kind of how I like to pitch it. So I don't know if I answered the question fully, but you know, that sounds good. Good, so I get it. <laughs> On that note, has there been any negative feedback to any of your projects? It's a good question. Um, no, not good. that I know. You know, the only thing that I will say is there have been student groups that are like, well, we have a heritage month and we'd like to be seen as well. And I don't even take that as a negative. I take that as an opportunity. Right. Um, so absolutely. Let's do a collection and let's make it a permanent collection, too. So you are represented within all the other collections that we have. So that would be the only thing that comes to mind. But I get excited when people reach out um, that want to do a collection. So um, I, I see it as a positive as well. How about what has been your experience with working with collaborators who have no or very little background um, in knowledge of acquisitions and collection development policies? That's a good question. You know, I, if it's an internal, you know, collaborator, I, they know the internal workings, at least to a certain extent. So I feel like I can kind of, um, pull the veil back a little bit and really speak honestly about what the expectations are or whatnot. When I'm working with outside collaborators, um, I really just try to speak with them in terms of like timeline. You know, I'm like, I, I have to work with a specific team in order to make sure that we get the books in time. And I will outline kind of what that looks like in terms of timeline. Um, I don't get into the nitty gritty unless they're very interested and students have been interested in terms of, you know, collection development and whatnot like that. But in terms of future collections, what's fun about them is that we kind of make our own collection development policy. Um, you know, we, we are the um, people that, you know, can create it and put it together. And I've never really, I've only ever encountered maybe one or two instances where I question a book that's included in a collection. And then that's a conversation that I have with the, you know, the person that's helping. Um, so that's, that's what I would say in terms of that. Try not to get into too much detail with external people. I give them as much information as they need, but internally we can have a more open and honest conversation. Are you doing any feature collections at ASU West currently is one of the questions. As of now, no, but Cardboard House Press will be down there, which I just confirmed, which I'm really excited about. I'd love to... I'd love to have like future collections make tour stops in each location. So that's something I've been talking about with like the library branch managers. And um, I know that they do have one future collection down at West Valley right now, which was um, the project from the last Hispanic 
Latinx Heritage Month that they translated into one of their feature collection spaces. And then there's a Labriola location out there. And I know that they do some collections as well. So they have stuff out there and they have their own display program. But um, whenever I can, you know, work with people out there, I take I take the opportunity. All right. How about how can you encourage those not directly in acquisitions, cataloging, or collection development teams to participate in feature collections, book suggestions, and more? Oh, I, I'll i either specifically ask for them to give me a book recommendation. I, I can't even tell you how many messages I sent out when we were doing the staff picks. I think mm -hmm. I probably sent over 60 Slack messages being like, please submit a book. I'm not afraid to ask. And I think that's a part of just my personality, but um, so I don't, see you know major challenges in that if they tell me no you know it's a no and that's okay but what i will say is that it's such a fun experience and you know if you work in a library typically you like to read and you like books so i hope it's not too hard of a sell but i'm always eager to work with people internally i've had such a good experience working with staff and librarians so if you're if you're interested or even thinking about it, please reach out to me because there's a way that we can plug you into one of the collections already being planned or we can come up with a totally different idea. All right. And how about what do you suggest if someone wants to begin a similar project? Where should they begin? Yeah, if they want to begin a similar project, I would really hone in your pitch. <laughs> if you're um if you're trying to you know, connect with your community or even internal people, knowing what you're going to be asking of people is really important, I think. Um, figuring out what's important to your community as well. Uh, I know that the most successful collections we've done are in, or are, are deliberate in the sense that we, we saw a need and now we're responding to it. And, um, you know, we're always listening and trying to figure out what is people's interest and what's happening on campus. So if you are in a public library, you know, plugging into that and making sure that you're kind of, you know, you're aware of what's going on. But then also, can you find the materials? Can you source the materials that you want in your collection? So kind of asking those questions as you're beginning the project and, um, you know, finding a subject expert or just like an insightful collaborator, um, if that's, you know, not you um, in terms of the subject. So that's what I would and always, it's good to have someone to bounce ideas off of too. So that's how, that's what I would suggest in terms of if you wanted to get started. Well, thank you so much for being here with us thank today. You. Do you have any final thoughts before we go? No, Reach out to me. Great. That's what I want to say. And I had such a good time talking about um, what we do. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you to everybody else for being here with us today. You'll receive an email with a link to the recording of the webinar. Feel free to share it with others and have a great day. Thank you, Corey. Thank you.